Okay, members, we will now move on to questions to the Minister for Infrastructure, and I call Ms. Rachel Woods. I am pleased to confirm that my department's programme of planned road resurfacing schemes is underway within the North Down area and currently includes schemes at Church Drive Bangor, Coltra Avenue Hollywood, Main Street Conleg and Tar Road Conleg. Clearly, there are many more schemes and programmes that are being developed across the North Down area, and these are being developed and will be included in Council reports that officials are currently preparing and intend to issue to Councils in due course. Rachel Wood, supplementary. Thank the Minister for her answer, but would she be able to tell me when the Kinnegar area of Hollywood would be up for resurfacing and commit to visiting the area with me, along with residents, to address a number of issues with surfacing roads and flooding issues that are present in the area? I don't have the specific details at hand, but I'm happy to write to the Minister and happy to engage with her and residents. And I call Alan Chambers. Speaker, uh, can the Minister provide an update on essential maintenance to ensure road safety, including gully clearing, grass verge cutting, and in particular account for delays in major pothole uh, repairs? As the member will be um, aware, the Department for Infrastructure has uh, suffered from a funding deficit for many, many years. In fact, uh, it was when his party colleague uh, held uh, the ministry that uh, there was a significant uh, amount of money taken from the department, and in all honesty, the department hasn't fully recovered. Um, we've had to scale back uh, services in terms of, of uh, gully cleaning and so forth, but we still try to do what we can, and I was pleased to be able to maintain the maintenance budget uh, this year in terms of my uh, allocation, but certainly uh, I would be really like to be in a position where I was able to do so much more. Unfortunately, due to funding constraints, uh, we are delivering the maximum service that we can at this stage, but I will continue to make the case to executive colleagues. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much. Speaker, uh, people in North Down are very disappointed to see there's such a low level of roads that are going to be resurfaced in this financial year. Will the Minister commit to be bidding for additional funding in the October monitoring round to ensure that North Down and all areas across Northern Ireland get that investment that they deserve? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I will be making uh, additional bids in the October monitoring round. I, I've said before in the floor uh, of this House that um, the Department for Infrastructure touches on people's everyday lives, uh, from the streetlights to their potholes, to bridges to how they get to uh, and from work. Um, I would like to be in a position to do uh, a lot more and will continue to make the case because I've always argued that if we are to have ambition as an executive um, to win people's hearts and minds, we also need to be getting the basics right, and that very much uh, involves the uh, level and maintenance of a roads network. I call Cahill Boylan. Accordingly, I could have thanked the Minister for answer so far. Minister, the audit report of 2019 has said that the trunk road network is in better condition than first estimated. Would the Minister consider prioritising rural roads in any of the budgets that she get? Because, I mean, clearly there is a number of complaints about rural roads in general. And one of my commitments as Minister is to tackle regional, Im uh, regional imbalance, and that is why I have set aside um, £10 million for a rural roads fund uh, to address the very issues that the member has highlighted. I call Jonathan Buckley. The member is right to raise the issues of resurfacing. Some three months ago, I raised in this House with the Minister the plight of Birchwood Manor in my own constituency. A meeting on the hope of progress was promised. To date, no meeting and no progress. Does the Minister think that it is acceptable that after some 10 years from completion, ratepayers have no finished surface, raised ironworks, lighting issues and serious sewage issues? Well, what I can commit to is uh, when I go back up to the office, I'll ask officials to meet with you um, on site to try to address the issues that you've raised uh, where we possibly can. Um, in terms of the site meeting, I don't know if you'd requested it with me or not uh, on the floor of this assembly. Certainly, we haven't, as a department, been able to have as many face-to-face -face meetings, including myself, as I would like, as a result of the restrictions around COVID, but happy to take the, the issue away for the member. Question two, I call Jim Allister. Question two. Whilst the COVID-19 pandemic led to some initial delays in commencement of the 20, 
2021 road maintenance programmes. These are now well underway, and it is envisaged that a significant proportion of the resurfacing programme will be delivered prior to the onset of the winter period. Prior to the start of each winter season, my department carries out a significant amount of pre-planning to ensure a state of readiness for the coming winter. This planning includes ensuring that adequate staffing arrangements are in place, all winter service equipment is in satisfactory working order, and there are adequate supplies of salt. There are also arrangements in place to supplement stocks of salt during the winter period if necessary. Whilst the Department targets the limited resources available for gridding towards the busier three routes, on many other routes which do not qualify for inclusion in the gridding schedule, salt bins or grit piles are provided for use by the public on a self-help basis. Subject to the availability of funding, a full winter service will operate from the 19th of October this year until the 5th of April 2021 and will have approximately 300 staff and 130 gridders available and ready to salt main roads in order to help drivers across Northern Ireland deal with the wintry conditions. Call Jim Allister, supplementary. Uh, given that one of the Minister's predecessors, Danny Kennedy, was starved of funding to adequately cut the grass verges or fix the potholes. Given what she has just said about matters being able to be done subject to funding, has she any fears that she might obtain the same treatment as a single member of the executive? I thank the member for his question, uh, and I think it is fair enough to say that there are significant challenges when you are a single member of a party uh, within the executive. That being said, I have provided robust detail to executive colleagues and to the finance minister on the importance of ensuring that we invest in our infrastructure uh, for the reasons that a number of members have highlighted in terms of streets uh, and places within their own constituencies, but also in terms of our recovery from COVID. Uh, I recently submitted an executive paper at where I set out the case, uh, which I believe is compelling, for ensuring that infrastructure is front and centre of our recovery from COVID um, and in terms of facing the challenges of, of Brexit. I will continue to make the case, and I hope that I do not befall the same fate as Danny Kennedy. I call Emma Sheeran. I get Ken Corley. Thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Will the Minister commit to adding the B47 uh, to the gridding schedule? This is a rural road that connects um, rural communities in Crana and Plumbridge with services in, in Drippertown and Marafelt, my own constituency. And at various points throughout most winters, it becomes totally inaccessible, leaving people uh, rurally isolated. I thank the member for her question, and I receive many requests uh, of the nature, uh, and I recognise the seriousness with which members um, put those queries to me and how sincere they are. Uh, at present, um, we salt 28 per cent of our total road network, and that carries 80 per cent of traffic volumes. That costs annually between five and seven million pounds. If we were to increase that to salt 90 per cent of the traffic volume, uh, that would double to between 10 and 14 million pounds and if we were to increase that to 100% it would increase further to around 28 million pounds how we fund our winter gridding services annually is through a monitoring round bids. So certainly I've submitted a bid to the Finance Minister for winter gridding services this year. I would be keen to try to do more and I would look to colleagues to help me make the case to the Finance Minister to ensure that we could receive additional funding to enhance their services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for our answers. Um, could I ask the Minister, just in relation to enhancement of the roads network, it's good to see progress on the A6, uh, a strategic road for travel across the north. Um, was this unduly affected by COVID and its progress? And if you could give us some sort of a time frame for completion of that route, please. I, I thank the member for his question, uh, and I recognise the crucial need for the A6 to be completed. And indeed, I'm 100% um, committed to his to its delivery. There has unfortunately been some slippage due to COVID-19, but I am pleased that the project is back on track and that we are due to see the similar completion rates and dates as we were expecting pre-COVID. I call Michelle Magalveen. Speaker. 
My department has been working collaboratively with the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs on coastal erosion risk management issues. The two departments commissioned a baseline study and gap analysis of coastal erosion risk management in Northern Ireland, and this was published in January 2019. The study collated existing data relating to coastal erosion and undertook a high-level vulnerability assessment. The primary conclusion from this assessment was that there is currently insufficient data to reliably inform coastal management decision-making. The study identified a number of key issues for consideration in determining the way forward, and the Coastal Forum, whose membership includes DFI, DERA, the seven councils with the coastline and the National Trust, is working collaboratively to address these. A draft coastal forum work programme has been developed and as part of this a project is underway to provide a comprehensive coastal survey and vulnerability assessment. The survey, which is led by DERA, will provide a comprehensive data baseline for our coast and subsequent surveys, perhaps every three or five years, and will develop a picture of how and when the coastline is changing over time. Other work progressed includes a position statement to assist councils with their consideration of coastal change when preparing local development plans. I know the member when she was Minister for Regional Development established a coastal forum and remains committed to this and I can assure her that I am very supportive of the coastal forum and the collaborative work that is progressing to devise solutions to the problems facing our coastline. Okay, thank you, and, and I'd like to thank the Minister for her answer. And, and while I welcome the study, essentially it tells us what we already knew back in 2016, and that was that there was insufficient data and that a comprehensive shoreline study was required. Is the Minister satisfied that the current mechanism of oversight from her department and DERA is sufficient to deliver and implement a coastal erosion risk management strategy, or should one department take the lead? Uh, certainly, it's an issue that I intend to be discussing with the um, Minister for um, the Environment uh, to see how we can take it forward. I am aware that in the absence of the Assembly, uh, the forum was jointly chaired by the Permanent Secretaries of both, so happy to work with my ministerial counterpart to try to move the issue forward. I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <coughs> in July this year, DEFRA published a new policy statement on flood and coastal erosion risk management. Uh, which aims to create greater resilience in flood and coastal risk management. So my question to the Minister is, would you advise of the outcome of the evaluation of her own approach to the Homeowner Flood Protection Grant, and whether she is open to ideas that have been adopted in other parts of the United Kingdom, such as well as infrastructure and flood defence, uh, to look at natural defences, and to look at how to build in resilience into housing, and to take a community-centred a uh, catchment-centred approach uh, to coming up with solutions. I very much do, and I am a believer that we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel and we should be learning best practice um, globally. I'm also very supportive of the approach that the member has outlined. We need to be building resilience. Uh, we need to be looking at our natural environment uh, as an aid and a protection uh, against flooding. And we need to recognise that we're in a climate emergency. And so we need to be doing everything that we can to address that. Even on a small scale, in terms of the £20 million that I've set aside for the Blue Green Fund, I've been very keen to see can we pilot SUDs uh, with housing associations, for example, so that we're embedding that resilience and that climate action uh, in the development and design uh, of housing schemes and at the centre of our community. So very keen uh, to do what we can to progress that and to take the ideas of members and others. I call Emma Rogan. Um, coastal erosion is, is a big um, issue in my own constituency of South Down as it impacts our land, property and our infrastructure. Does the Minister agree that we need the strongest possible measures in place to address this challenge and provide coastal communities with the long-term term sustainable answers? In short, I do. Uh, one of the difficulties here is, uh, as the chair of the committee pointed out, um, there is no one department with overall responsibility for this area. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be ambitious and try to work together. That's why I'm very supportive of the collaborative approach that's being taken forward by the Coastal Forum, and will continue to do what I can to support it as minister. And I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, question number four. 
I am aware of the Department for Transport Fix Your Bike Voucher Scheme in England. I understand that this scheme was introduced at the end of June this year. The aim of the scheme is to encourage more people to embrace cycling, boost the number of commuting and leisure trips and to help reduce the number of short journeys made by private cars. However, as the member indicates in his question, the scheme is aimed at providing assistance for bicycle repair or refurbishment. The vouchers, in effect, provide a grant of up to £50 towards the repair and servicing of bicycles to encourage owners to start using their old bikes again. It does not provide any assistance, though, for people who do not currently own a bicycle uh, to purchase one. For many people, the fact that they cannot afford a bicycle is a real barrier to cycling for them. Uh, and I think that it is regrettable that the scheme does not address that reality. But I have asked my officials to closely monitor the progress of the scheme in order to determine its effectiveness, value for money and the possible benefits which might accrue to Northern Ireland were such a scheme to be introduced here. I am mindful, however, that a similar scheme in Northern Ireland could cost around £700,000. And unfortunately, given the resource budget allocated to my department and the significant pressures as a result, this scheme would be currently unaffordable without additional funding being provided to the Department for Infrastructure. I call John Blair supplementary. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I can thank the Minister for that answer, which I think leaned at least towards a, a semi commitment to, to this issue. Can, can I ask the Minister, in light of that, that if we were to identify the merits of this scheme and be able to identify it in Northern Ireland, um, would she consider introducing a prioritisation structure uh, whereby those in most need got help first? This is something that I've asked my officials to actively consider, and we are considering ways in which it might be possible to make bicycles more easily available to those who are not in employment or who are unable to avail of the current schemes. And I'm particularly looking at school children to see what we can do there. As a member may be aware, the Cycle to Work scheme is currently available for employers throughout Northern Ireland. It's a salary sacrifice scheme operating between individual employers and HMRC, and it helps employees to get access to a bicycle with significant savings. There is a Northern Ireland civil service scheme, and many other employers have their own schemes. So I would be keen to do what we can to maximise the schemes that currently exist, but also I'm keen to look to see what we can do to enable those, particularly those who can't afford to get bicycles to cycle, what we can do to better assist them uh, through the Blue Green Fund and my walking and cycling champion. Can I call Philip McGuigan? Can I thank and welcome the Minister's announcement last week of £2.8 million into the Greenway projects, six Greenway projects, and thank her for her commitment to that. But caveat with the fact that neither the Bally Castle, the Ballymoney Greenway, nor the Glen of Antrim Greenway from Ballymena to Cushendall in my own constituency were successful. So in light of that, can I ask the Minister if there will be further additional funding for Greenway projects that did not get in the current round of Yes, and I appreciate it was a very positive announcement, but I also understand that it will be met with disappointment by others who, who haven't seen the advancement of schemes in their areas, uh, kind of caught in a bind in terms of capital money, very quick need to get it spent. And we reached out to all of the councils. I was very clear to emphasise this is just the first step, and I. I cannot preempt what allocations might be made to my department, but I have said very clearly that I am committed to enhancing the Blue Green Fund and doing what we can to enhance our home greenways experience right across Northern Ireland. So I look forward to working with the member and hopefully seeing progress in his constituency. I call Catherine Kelly. Question five, please. I am committed to tackling regional imbalance, connecting communities and improving road safety. There are so many communities, particularly in rural parts west of the Ban, who can benefit from investment in the A5 project. The A5 is also a commitment of the executive and Irish and British governments and is specifically referenced in New Decade New Approach. And I, am delivered to, I am determined to deliver progress. A public inquiry for the project concluded in March 2020, and my officials received an interim report from the Commissioner on the 2nd of September. Officials are considering the issues raised and recommendations made in the report, in addition to taking legal advice before I decide on the next steps for this very important scheme. The Irish Government reaffirmed its commitment of £75 million to the project in New Decade New Approach. And the importance of the A5 was also discussed at the recent North-South Ministerial Council meeting, and I very much welcome uh, that commitment. 
I have had initial discussions with the Irish Transport Minister, uh, Minister Ryan, and will be meeting with him again later this month. And I look forward to further discussion on how we can work together in partnership to deliver on this much-needed project for citizens across our island. Catherine Kelly, Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answers. It is vital that the Irish Government honour their original commitment to the A5 project. And of course, this also opens up possibilities to expedite the construction process. Minister, can you assure us that you will pursue this urgent matter with the Irish Government, which is of course led by your party's Fianna Fáil partners? I can assure the member that I will always do what I can to maximise funding. Uh, we live in very difficult financial times and certainly I won't be found wanting in working with anyone and any political party across this island to ensure that we can deliver improvements and enhance the lives of all of our citizens. I call Dolores Kelly. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, I'm sure you'll join with me in wishing a speedy recovery to our colleague Daniel McCrossan, who would be asking a supplementary if he had been here uh, this afternoon. But uh, I wonder, have you any indicative time frame um, in, in relation to uh, the work that you outlined in your earlier answer? I thank the member for a question, and I do want to send our, our party colleague Daniel um, his best wish, our best wishes. And no doubt, if he was here, he would be very much asking this question. Uh, it's a hobby horse of his. Um, yes, as I said, the public inquiry was held um, earlier this year, and it concluded um, in March. And my department did receive the interim report on the 2nd of September. It has raised uh, a number of issues, and they are being very carefully considered by officials. We're also taking legal advice on that. But I would hope to be in a position very soon to be able to update the House uh, on the next steps. I call Rosemary Barton. Minister, I thank you for your questions, so for your answers so far. Does the Minister accept that the A5 has been specified a level above that the, what the traffic volume would normally justify, that of adopting a new route and largely disregarding the existing roads? Therefore, I ask, with the growing cost estimates and the absence of the promised 400 million from the Republic, that it can only now proceed with the loss of many other infra infrastructure projects, such as other roads, cycle routes and upgrading projects. Thank you. I thank the member um, for her question. And um, while finances are always tight, I don't believe that it is always a question of either or. I actually believe, and I would be saying this even if I wasn't the Minister for Infrastructure, that infrastructure and investment in infrastructure is a catalyst for change. It is an economic driver. It's a critical tool in terms of tackling the climate emergency. This is being demonstrated by governments right across uh, the world. And the A5, it is an executive flagship, and it is also referenced in New Decade, New Approach. So it is very much a firm commitment of the executive. And I call Harry Harvey. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers thus far. That will be question number six. Thank you. I announced on the 2nd of July that I intend to introduce the exemption of vehicles of historic interest from periodic roadworthiness testing in Northern Ireland. The exemption will align Northern Ireland legislation with that in GB and will apply to those vehicles that were first registered at least 40 years ago, are no longer in production and have not been significantly modified. The exemption will not apply to those vehicles that are still in public service. I can advise the member that the draft regulations required to introduce the exemption have recently received legal clearance and have been led in the Assembly on the 18th of September 2020. They are subject to the Assembly statutory period that applies within the negative resolution procedure. It is anticipated that they will come into force on the 12th of October. I know how passionate the member is, and he has been a very active campaigner on this issue on behalf of the vintage vehicle community. So I hope this news and this success makes him happy. Supplementary, Mr. Harvey. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister not only for her kind words and her answer, but also for her positive consideration to this scheme, and now bringing it to its implementation stage. I hope that I have been plaguing you in a somewhat pleasant manner, even if it has been on a regular occurrence. We never did manage to fall out. Minister, would you agree with myself that the historical vehicle owners really deserve credit for their mostly unrecognised charitable work and hours that they put into their vehicles, raising huge sums of money 
for various charities. And Minister, can I just finish by saying thanks and appreciation from myself on behalf of all those enthusiasts that I've been lobbying for. Thank you. I thank the member for uh, his kind words. And you know, this wasn't an issue that was particularly on my radar until I took up this post. And you very kindly and very actively made sure it was on my radar. Um, and I, I thank you for that. And, and shown me up close as well the great work of the historical vehicle community, particularly the work that it does um, for charities. And it does so not seeking recognition, but I think like many groups uh, and communities right across Northern Ireland, we have a responsibility to acknowledge it and to recognise it because they make a huge contribution uh, and they do so quietly but hugely effectively. I may call you Mr Happy Harry. Thank you very much. I <laughs> will um, we'll call Sean Lynch. I get, uh, can call you. Will the Minister also provide us with an update on whether the Department is exploring the biannual testing for certain vehicles, as happens in the 26 counties? Yes, and, and the member will know that I advised the committee that I was keen to explore this. Um, I've asked my officials to move to a call uh, for evidence, and we hope that that will uh, begin and be completed by the end of this year, uh, and then I will be able to take stock uh, and decide on next steps. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his announcement. Um, this will help in a very small way to the current situation with regards to the backlog for MOTs. Um, as the Minister will be aware, the temporary exemption certificates are no longer being issued for four year old cars, and as a result, uh, I have been contacted by many constituents struggling to get through to the booking line to be get an MOT secured. What is being done to ensure that this, this is ended and people are able to get their MOTs booked? Yeah. Uh, and, and this has been an issue. Um, we um, have seen a huge increase in the number of calls to the booking centre, and currently vehicle test bookings can only be made through the DVA call centre. Um, so customers have been experiencing difficulties in getting through, and for that I apologise. Uh, to mitigate against this issue and the general high volume of calls being handled by call agents, the DVA is introducing a call messaging service to redirect calls to NI Direct. Capita has also agreed in principle to extend their opening hours by an additional two hours from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, from Monday through to Wednesday to provide additional capacity. And these measures are to be implemented from Wednesday, the 23rd of September. Uh, to further alleviate pressure on Capita Call Centre, the DVA will continue to engage directly with the haulage industry, um, particularly those operators with large fleets, to facilitate bookings at local test centres uh, as well, where that is possible. I would also uh, encourage members to encourage their constituents to check online to, uh, for the status of their vehicle. If they go to www. If I remember it correctly, um, it's uh, GB, and then it's, I think it's check your status. Um, I'll, I can correct that afterwards. But if you go onto that, you're able to see the, the status of your vehicle. So, a number of vehicles have been given temporary exemption certificates um, and have no need to go for an MOT. So, I would encourage members to direct their constituents to that website. I'll call Gemma Dolan. Thank you. Um, number seven, please. Uh, this is undoubtedly an extremely distressing situation for residents of Galliff Shore. This is, as I know the member is aware, a very complex issue in a private development where a developer has not entered into an agreement with Northern Ireland Water to adopt the sewers in the development. The developer has subsequently gone into liquidation and the sewage infrastructure is overflowing and causing pollution. While this matter is not of the residents making, uh, neither my department nor Northern Ireland Water has legal responsibility for addressing this issue. However, I am sensitive to the residents' extreme distress and I have therefore written to Conor Murphy, the Minister for Finance, to seek an urgent meeting to discuss Galliff Shore and other private development sites with inadequate private sewage infrastructure, as well as the funding shortfall facing Northern Ireland Water, which is inhibiting it from being able to meet its statutory obligations. My hope is that working together, a solution can be found to these issues. That ends the period for a list of questions, and we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call on Ms. Claire Bailey. And could I say, Claire, that since you won the number one ballot on both ministers today, would you like to share your lottery ticket numbers? No well, Claire chance, Bailey, Mr. Speaker, no chance. <laughs> Be the first number one I get. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to 
Just also, well, welcome the announcement from the Minister last week on the, the movement for the North-South Interconnector. Um, and while it is a good first step forward for our long underfunded energy infrastructure, I wanted to ask the Minister, has she had any discussion with officials about resurrecting the Camlock hydro storage scheme? I haven't had any discussions with officials on that matter, but keen to raise it with them um, later on. Supplementary, Claire Billy. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I think that would be good if the Minister could. Um, and I think that it's really, really key because people in Northern Ireland, um, consumers in particular, have been paying um, very high rates of energy in Northern Ireland. And I would see this as one of the reasons why and the lack of storage and infrastructure to, to get that balance. So I know that the scheme has started 40 years ago um, and that a lot of work had been done and it's been stalled. And I just think in the current context, it's not just a good opportunity for lower in prices and availability, but a great uh, green job creation scheme as well. And I do share the member's view. We have the importance of securing uh, the supply of energy, but also, as the member has pointed out, the importance of ensuring that it is affordable uh, to people uh, as well. So keen to do what we can to ensure that we have security of supply, uh, but also doing what we can to bring down prices. I think it's very important, too, that where we can, we maximise the opportunities to, uh, to increase the provision of renewable energies as well. I call Pat Sheehan. Um, I, I, I listened with interest to Mr Muir's question to the Minister about the difficulty people are having trying to get through the, the DVA line uh, to book vehicle tests. And I sort of got lost. I thought it was, the answer was a bit convoluted. And, and really the question I want to ask is, why is the Department not building capacity into the DVA's booking line? Kermagod. I thank the member for his question. It is building capacity. Um, that's why it said in capita we're increasing the number of hours that the service is available. That's to ensure that it is extended in terms of its hours and we have additional staff answering. One of the other challenges is that a number of people are calling the call centre for additional queries and that's putting pressure on the system, which is why we're now putting in the um, automated service to better direct people to where they need to go for help. We're also doing what we can to lift um, capacity and pressures off the system by engaging directly with our hauliers, for example, so that they do not have to go through the call booking system. So we're putting in a number of measures to increase their capacity, but also to redirect those who are calling the centre, and that isn't the best number for them to get the help that they actually need. I thank the Minister for that answer. And I'm just wondering, what is the department doing to address the backlog and driving tests? Yeah, so um, the member will be aware that we have um, reinstated a number of practical driving tests for different vehicles. Uh, we are at the moment working through priority workers and then also those who had their tests cancelled. I think that is a fair and balanced uh, approach. We have also uh, recruited two new vehicle examiners. Their training um, will take 10 days. We're due to start uh, in 10 days. And we're also in the process of recruiting an additional tw 12 temporary vehicle examiners in the next few weeks. Uh, the purpose of that is that we have uh, 40 dual role examiners at present who can carry out both the practical driving tests and the vehicle examinations. By bringing in the additional vehicle examiner capacity, we will be freeing those people up to carry out practical driving tests. In addition to that, we are exploring um, extending the hours into the evening when practical driving tests can be carried out and also examining the possibility of carrying out tests on a Sunday. But as I'm sure the member will appreciate, we need to make sure that there are proper driving conditions against which to, against which to assess the candidates. I call Patsy McGlone. Um, could I just ask the Minister, she will be aware of repeated severe flooding along the course of the River Myola. And in fact, I have had several meetings with Rivers Agency over, uh, over the course of a number of years, in fact, about that severe flooding. Can the Minister give any details as to what flood mitigation measures would be introduced along the course of the River Myola, please? I thank the member for his question, and I am aware that it is an issue that he has been raising for some time on behalf of his constituents. Uh, the measures being undertaken on the designated stretches of the Myola River include the inspection 
and the repair of the existing flood defences. This work involves the removal of heavy vegetation, treatment of invasive species, repair and reinstatement of the existing northern flood defences. Sections of the Moyola River are maintained every year, and this water course maintenance work includes the removal of channel silt and aquatic weed growth, removal of obstructions from the channel which restrict the free flow of water. The maintenance may also include upgrade or replacement, if necessary, of flap valves. Thank the Minister for her uh, comprehensive answer. Uh, specifically at two locations, if I could ask the Minister what measures can be introduced or in fact speeded up at River Road, Dipperstown and at the Broch Castle Dawson. Thank the member for his question. Uh, in respect to 10 River Road, my officials are aware of this issue and have advised that it is unlikely that there would be financially viable flood alleviation scheme um, at uh, 10 River Road to reduce flood impacts. However, the department suggested that the owner considers the homeowner flood protection grant scheme, and I can confirm that we have received the application from the homeowner. We're keen to work with them. Uh, in respect of Brock, we pronounced that right. The project team involved with the ongoing construction of the A6 Randallstown to Castle Dawson scheme has commissioned their consultant to investigate the incident, which will seek to determine the cause of the flooding. At that stage, the team will consider uh, what mitigation measures might be appropriate. This process is likely to take two months, but I'm happy to keep the member fully updated. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Following, uh, I'd like to ask the Minister, following the news of TransLink's plans to make £20 million in cost reductions, can the Minister provide an update on its financial position and whether it will have the reserves it needs to operate legally in this financial year and in 2021-22, please? Thank the member for her question, uh, and she references the, the efficiency savings and potential, well, likely redundancies at TransLink. And COVID-19 continues to have a major impact on passenger numbers, and it's seen a significant uh, decline in the income faced by TransLink. Uh, there have been uh, allocations from the executive for TransLink. Uh, that is very welcome. I think it's recognition of the fact that uh, public, it is a critical public service, and I have a current bid in. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's concerning that these savings are going to lead to redundancies. And while it is an operational matter for TransLink and the accounting officer, I have said, where possible, uh, can we explore the voluntary redundancy uh, aspect? But it is a hugely challenging time. In respect of the position facing my department, uh, it is hugely concerning. Uh, but I will continue to work with the finance minister and with executive colleagues to try to secure the resources um, that we need to be able to, to do our job and deliver the critical public services, particularly our Public transport and Northern Ireland water. Supplementary, Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much. Tomorrow is no car day, and it, as the Minister has said, um, it's public transport is a cr critical public service, but I do have concerns that the rural, non-economically viable services may bite the big one, to be quite honest, if TransLink get into trouble. Can the Minister provide an assurance that rural areas will not um, suffer more as a result of the pressures? Um, I have been assured that the efficiency savings of £20 million this time round will not impact on the services. But I have to also point out that if further savings and cuts are required, then it will impact on services. That's why I was pleased previously to have secured a commitment from the executive that we are committed to a publicly owned public transport network. But the question for us is, if we believe that we should have a publicly owned public transport network that operates on need and not profit, which is particularly important to our rural communities, then we absolutely have to fund it. I call Dolores Kelly. Mr. Speaker, Minister, I'm sure you uh, share uh, the worry and spike uh, that is uh, becoming more apparent in COVID-19 cases. So, have you, have you, Minister, made an assessment on the impact on service delivery or recovery on, tra on your department? I thank the member for her question. And like all members, I am deeply concerned at the increased levels of COVID-19 in our community. And as a member of this assembly and of the executive, I will always put the health and safety of our population first. Every day is challenging for all of us with rule changes, with changes to services and changes to family life. And I know people want clarity and they want a clear plan. While my department has put in place a clear plan for our services, I have to be honest with the public that there is nothing sure with this virus and no one can say with certainty that services will not be affected if there are future restrictions. 
I can, however, advise that DFI continues to do all we can, following strictly the health advice, but also doing what we can to minimise disruption to the public. My senior team is already meeting regularly to discuss and plan for our response and our recovery from COVID-19. With infection rates increasing, we all have to be prepared. I am confident that my department is focused on progressing the restoration of services while maintaining a firm focus on responding to COVID-19 with contingency planning in place should we face a second wave. I ask members and the wider public to remain on your guard, to work together, washing our hands, keeping to social distancing and following the advice of the Health Minister to keep each other safe. And I call uh, Dolores Kelly, supplementary. Thank you, um, Minister. Uh, thank you and your department for your diligence in, in uh, giving clear messages. But, Minister, there is a, a, some confusion, and particularly on school buses, where there are also other service users, particularly in rural areas, where children and young people, some wear masks, some don't have to. And I think that's probably because of the, the height of some of our young people they may well be under the age for having to wear the mask, but look much older. And it is causing a level of confusion. So therefore, Minister, I wonder, along with the Education Minister, if you could provide some reassurance uh, uh, to uh, transport and ser uh, service users. I thank the member for her question. Uh, and that's why I moved to make face coverings mandatory on the public transport network. Um, obviously, there are clear exemption categories, but it is mandatory for those aged 13 uh, and above. Um, I understand that uh, uh, you know, there has been a different approach taken on school transport, and I did engage with the Education Minister, uh, to my mind. I think uh, it would have been more beneficial to have uniformity. In, in approach, but I mean, TransLink is engaging with schools um, so that we are encouraging our young people and making it clear to them that when they're on the public transport network, they, they must wear a face covering, uh, but strongly encouraging them when they're on school transport uh, as well. Uh, and I would encourage all of us um, as elected representatives, but also as parents, to ensure that we are making sure our children have face coverings because it will keep them uh, and other passengers safe. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, could you please provide us with an update on the use of free public transport by those fleeing domestic abuse as announced in July? Thank you. Yes, as the member uh, points out, working with the Justice Minister and with Women's Aid uh, and others who are involved in this very important work, we introduced uh, free transport uh, for those who are fleeing domestic uh, abuse. My understanding is that the uptake has been small, but I think even if it helps one person leave an abusive relationship, then it will be very much have been worth it. Paula Bradshaw, supplementary. Um, thank you, and I appreciate that it was really brought in because of COVID lockdown. And I'm just wondering, with the small numbers, are you minded just to continue it? I am committed to continuing it. I think, yes, it did come in, um, in with the backdrop of COVID, but it is something that I would have been keen to progress um, without it. I call John Blair, but I don't think you'll get a supplementary. But uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I welcome the Minister's announcement of the first phase of this year's Park and Ride programme in Northern Ireland. There was, however, no mention of cycle parking within these plans. Can I ask the Minister, given that um, one car park space equates to probably around space for 12 bicycles, um, if she will commit to trying to incorporate cycle parking within these plans? Yes, I am committed to doing that. Um, the park and ride schemes are at various stages. Um, some will move to land acquisition, but a number of them are at the detailed design stage. And I've said to my officials that we should be maximising active travel. For me, it's the combination. Uh, so we need to be encouraging people to be able to walk and to cycle to our bus stations, to our train uh, stations, to our halts, um, but making sure that they have the space to safely secure their bicycles so it will feature in the design. And our, our time is up. Members will be aware that I have uh, accepted urgent oral questions tabled by Justin McNulty and Doug Beattie. Normally these would be taken now. However, the ministers involved have requested that I defer these questions uh, to the end of scheduled business this afternoon. And this is to allow the ministers to attend an emergency meeting of the executive taking place uh, very shortly. I understand that this meeting is critical in relation to the executive's ongoing management of COVID-19. Uh, so I have obviously agreed to this request on this basis. The urgent oral questions will now be taken immediately after the debate on promoting dementia-friendly policy. Revised indicative timings have been issued and are available in the business office. Could I ask members now to take the raise to be uh, ready for the next uh, item on the agenda?